remain standing for the reading of the Word of God. Today's scripture reading will be taken from the book of John, chapter 15. John, John chapter 15, verses 18 through 21. John 15, 18. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it had hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. This is the word of God for the people of God today. Let's pray now and ask for help. Our Father, we stand before you as a great host of people purchased by your Son. We come as your people pleading now help and grace and mercy. We're praying that you would be gracious to us by showing us the reality of the world in which we live, the condition of our hearts, and what it is to be a follower of Christ. We understand what hangs in the balance. Certainly our joy and your exaltation. I pray that any who are deluded or diverted from truth would be wonderfully rescued and helped. And for all of us, grant us to see the way you see so that we might live in this world exalting of Christ but not drinking from its broken cisterns, not loving this world as those who will perish with it. Oh, God, be our help. God, come. Grant us this grace. Keep us from shipwreck. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. I'm finding these sermons on the eclipse of Christian difficult, difficult feeling the burden of trying to make this clear, difficult because my own ears, my own mind is so affected by the God-ignoring air of our time, my own Christianness. So, so affected by this pretending age. Asking this question for so many years, what is real and are we real? Especially in light of all of the text that warns us against delusion and that our hearts will lie to us and that Satan is an angel of light, and that all the world is set against us. With that, uh, I have a parable for this pretending age, a question that may reveal. And then if you're back with us tonight, I have a recantation and a correction. It may not be what you think. First, a parable. This comes from the pen of Calvin Miller. He had an Amish pen pal named Reuben that he had never met. Reuben got married to Sadie and wanted to visit the Millers on their honeymoon. The story is picked up there. They arrived on a bus. I'll never forget picking them up. They were in their black clothes, and that was unusual in Omaha. 
I took them to my house. My children looked at them like they were relics from the deep past. I took them to church, and the church looked at them that way too. I found myself living with people who had never listened to a radio program or seen a television or gone to a movie. A world of definition unfolded all week long. At this point, the story turns. Miller invited them to attend the musical Camelot. I remembered Luther's dictum about going against conscience being neither safe nor right, and I didn't want to spoil their conscience, so I said, remember, this is a play, and sometimes they do funny things in plays. Reuben said, Calvin, I know your letters. You would never lead me into sin. Calvin warned Reuben that at one point the actors and actresses wore leotards. Reuben said, what's leotards? I tried to explain leotards to an Amish person. It is very difficult to do this. Everyone in the theater had seen Camelot at least 50 times, except Reuben and Sadie. So Reuben and Sadie watched Camelot. Everybody else watched Reuben and Sadie watch Camelot. On the way home, when you usually talk about the play, they were very quiet. I felt like I had stolen the heart out of their faith. When they got back to Pennsylvania, they wrote me a wonderful letter thanking me for everything, and especially that play. I think Reuben loves God with all of his heart, but he is unintelligible in a modern culture. That phrase captured my mind. He is unintelligible to a modern culture. You know what I think, Miller continues, you know what I think about true believers in Jesus? I think you might as well put on your black hat and suit now. If we stand true to Jesus Christ in the world that's unfolding, we shall look as out of place to our culture as Reuben and Sadie looked to me. Unintelligible to a modern culture. Now, before you take up arms to shoot some wag that would consider we all become Amish, which I'm not. Consider what your response was or might have been as you listened to this parable of sorts. Might have your mind said this, what's wrong with Camelot? If your mind goes there, what, what, what's wrong with Camelot? It's not that there's anything wrong with Camelot. But the question betrays how deeply your mind has been affected by the air of a God-ignoring culture. Because that is precisely the kind of question that the world by definition, asks. When the world's value set is questioned, the world responds with, what's wrong with fill in the blank? It is not a Christian response, at least not uniquely Christian. The uniquely Christian response to all of the created universe and all the value set of the world that comes at it must not be defined in lesser terms than you have been created and redeemed. And you have been created and redeemed for this ultimate end, that you might be to the praise of the glory of God that you might be a reflection back to God of the value of his word. 
the value set of heaven would respond this way. What is most Christ-exalting? The knee-jerk response of the value set of heaven is not what's wrong with. In our day and age, I'm groping for living human beings wrestling with these kind of questions. And candidly, I'm coming up with very few. Most are so capitulated to the value set of the world that they can't even think the thought, let alone think through it deeply. One is at least trying. He's familiar to you. His name is John Piper. He writes, people who are content with the avoidance ethic generally ask the wrong question about behavior. They ask, what's wrong with it? What's wrong with this movie or this music or this game or these companions or this way of relaxing or these clothes or this investment or this restaurant or shopping at this store? What's wrong with going to the cabin every weekend or having a cabin? This kind of question will rarely yield a lifestyle that commends Christ as all-satisfying and makes people glad in God. It's simply the wrong question. It's on an entirely different continuum of definition of life. Autonomy is being threatened, and when autonomy is threatened, the reaction is, what's wrong with? All you have to do is spend five minutes watching any TV, talk program, news program, just watch Katie Couric. She will show you what it looks like. Anytime the world is challenged by some absolutism or claim to it, the reaction is simply and invariably, oh, what's wrong with? The writer continues, the better question to ask about possible behaviors is, How will this help me treasure Christ more? How will it help me show that I do treasure Christ? How will it help me know Christ or display Christ? The Bible says whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do to the glory of God. And even by my recitation of these thoughts, our reaction probably is to fight with it. Fight with it, as Jesus says in Luke 16, to those who, when he says, you are those who want to justify yourself before men. And his very next phrase that indicts and informs is, what is highly esteemed, highly valued by men is detestable in the sight of God. The what's wrong with question seems, seems, operative word seems, seems to beg the issue of what's highly esteemed and seems to beg justifying what's highly esteemed amongst men. Please think through that more than five seconds. The question so often, what's wrong with, seems to be on the continuum of can I justify what's highly esteemed among men. All that to try to awaken us to the possibility that we have drunken more deeply than we might desire from the value set of hell. We are known by our questions. There was a great Puritan, great in the sense of he was voluminous in his writing, and he thought well. His name was Thomas Watson. He wrote, if Satan can keep men from the belief of the truth, he is sure to keep them from the practice of it. Knowledge without practice serves only as a torch to light men to hell. I fear that. I fear that. 
There's this little phrase in a song that says it maybe even more colloquially, and it helps me. The authors are Cademan's Call. I don't necessarily like their beat all the time, but they write great words. This world has nothing for me, and this world has everything. All that I could ever want, but nothing that I need. That is a parody of 1 John 2. Love not the world, neither the things that are in it. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. For love of the Father and love of the world are mutually exclusive. They cannot exist together. And all that is of the world is passing away and will be destroyed. And all those who love the world will be destroyed with it. This world has nothing for you. And this world has everything. All that you could possibly ever want, this world has. And there's not anything that you need. Only, only those things that have the potential of becoming your God in making shipwreck of life. It's at that point that I'm asking a different question this Lord's Day. Can we hear the voice of Jesus in this pretending age? And for that, I'd like you to walk with me through the texts that reveal that voice in Luke 9. Can we hear the voice of Jesus in this pretending age? When that which is called Christian so often is not. Hence my tension. If Christian is used as an adjective, does it bear any responsibility of being genuinely, uniquely Christian? Listen to Jesus, and he's speaking in terms of following him in this world. When Jesus calls us, as Bonhoeffer said, he bids us come and die, die to self and die to the world. Luke 9, verse 23. This is after he says, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be crucified. He was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. And now the informing text on verse 24. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world, if he loves the world, if life is defined by the value set of the world, if he finds anything in the world more satisfying than Christ, what is he profited if he gains the world and loses or forfeits himself? The question begs the answer. If you are out to gain the world, you will forfeit your soul. They are mutually exclusive. That is informed by verse 26. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Think through that. Does following Christ cause you shame from the world? Are you ashamed of how you have to live following Christ? Let me ask it differently. What causes you to be ashamed? 
And once you have the answer to that question, then you have to ask my other diagnostic, why? Why does that cause you to be ashamed? You say to your friends, I, I can't go there. And they mock you. Are you being shamed for Christ? Or do you capitulate so that you are not shamed by men? You fill in the blank of the scenario. Time would fail for us to think through them all. Those who are ashamed of following Jesus won't. And verse 26 says, God will be ashamed of you at his coming. These are not means of salvation. These are evidences of following Christ. He informs further in chapter 14, verse 16. He said to him, a man was giving a big dinner and he invited many and at the dinner hour he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, come, come to my dinner for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I bought a piece of land, I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I've bought five yoke of oxen. I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have married a wife and for that reason I cannot come. For a field, a yoke of oxen, and a wife, people will not follow Jesus. So he explains it. Verse 25. Now large crowds were gathering, coming along, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Love for Christ is supreme over love for any other human being, including your own life. Love for Christ is supreme. It's the defining love of life. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then... None of you can be my disciple who does not give up all of his possessions. There can be no possession clung to and forfeit following Christ. Therefore, salt is good, but it, even salt has become tasteless. With what will it be seasoned? It is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It's thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear this. There is no divided heart. Love for a possession over love for Christ, then you can't follow me. Love for plans and dreams and futures over love for Christ, then you can't follow Christ. Love over a person, love for a person supremely over, love for following Christ and what that means, and you can't follow Christ. Because at the deepest level of human relationship, at the deepest level of human possession, at the deepest level of human dreams and desires, Jesus stands as supreme. John 12, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. 
and he who hates his life. He who lives in a way that the world would say, that man, that woman hates their life. Live in such a way so that the world, when they look at you, says, you must hate your life to live like that. He who hates his life in this world shall keep it to eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall my servant also be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. To be Christian is to die to self and all of the sinful pleasures of this world. Dietrich Bonhoeffer would put it this way. The cross is laid on every Christian. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. It may be a death like that of the first disciples who had to leave home and work to follow him. Or it may be a death like Luther's who had to leave the monastery and go out into the world. But it is the very same death every time. Death in Jesus Christ. The death of the old man at his call. That is why the rich young man was so loath to follow Jesus. If you turn to Galatians 6, there is an epistolary text now that I think is commentary on what Jesus has been saying. And my question as I read Galatians 6 is this. Is there following Jesus on any other terms? Galatians 2 has already said, I have been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And now in Galatians 6, verse 14, we read this startling statement. But may it never be that I would boast. There is glory in nothing else except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is my only boast. If I claim anything, I claim boasting in the cross of Christ. If I glory in anything, it's glory in the cross of Christ. If I find anything to promote, it is to promote the glory of Christ. If I find anything that is worthy of praise and honor and my life, it is the cross of Christ. If I boast in anything, Paul writes, I boast in the cross through which the cross through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Is there following Jesus on any other terms? If following Jesus means that the world holds nothing that lures me, I am dead to the world and the world is dead to me. Could Paul say it in any more clear terms? This world has nothing for me. And this world has everything. All that I could ever want. But let me change the phrase. But nothing that I can love. Is that not what Paul says? That to follow Christ is to embrace the cross... To embrace the cross is to have the cross as the defining thing over my life. That my life is a cross life, dead to self, dead in the world, alive to Christ, alive to following Christ. Is, are these not the terms that Jesus lays out? Take up your cross, then you can follow me. Doesn't Paul give it definition? For all those who say, what does that mean, take up your cross, follow me? Does he not give it definition? Gladly then I will boast in nothing except the cross. Which means I'm dead to the world and the world is dead to me. It does not have final sway. It is not the end for which I live. It does not define who I am. I am not a slave to this world. This world is dead to me. How many times a day 
do we say autobiographically that we are alive to this world? And this world is alive to me. How many times a day? It never ends. It comes at us. It comes at us at every waking moment. This is why those who are trying to help us would say, we are breathing God ignoring air. Or another would say, there is the gagging of God in this culture. Or another would say that God is allowed to exist, but he's weightless. He just doesn't matter. Trying to grope for language to describe the incredibly desperate war that we live in. Far worse than anything going on in Afghanistan. And I say that with all due respect for those who are putting their physical lives on the line for our country and our freedoms. I mean it in the biblical sense that to die in sin, to die loving the world, is worse than dying. Some of you, my friends, are sitting here today and have drunk so deeply at the air of this world that talking this cross-like kind of life just seems strange to you. Sin seems normal and righteousness seems weird. It seems weird to consider what would be the most Christ-exalting, Christ-commending way to live. It seems normal to ask what's wrong with, what's wrong with, what's wrong with. And all that proves is that you're fighting, fighting, fighting against one who would challenge that you are not your own. You are purchased by Christ. Not for the glory of the world or the glory of self, but for the glory of Christ. What do you find glory in? That's the question Paul asks. Following Christ on his terms is the means to not being lured by the world. I think Luke 9, Luke 14, John 12 are all definitions of what it means to be Christian. And it cannot be defined in lesser terms. We have been saved for this end, that we would boast in the glory of the cross and that our lives would show that that's what we love. To follow Jesus is to boast in the cross and abandon the world. We go back to John 15 and our text for the day. Jesus says it this way in verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. But all these things they will do to you. Why? Why are they doing it? It's because you love the name of Christ because they do not know the one who sent me. And he who hates me hates my father also. John 17, verse 9, I ask on their behalf, those who believe, I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those who thou thou hast given me, for they are thine. Verse 14, I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Can we hear that? Just as Christ is not of the value set of hell, so we are not. I don't ask thee to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Or Matthew 6, 19. Do not, stop, do not lay up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves breaks in and steal. Don't do that. Don't invest your life here. You'll lose your life if you do it. Don't invest here. Lay up treasures in heaven. Invest your life in heaven. And then he concludes, you cannot serve God and mammon. 
He goes on. For this reason, I say to you, don't be anxious for your life. Don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink or how long you're going to live or your body or your wealth or anything. Is, this, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Don't be anxious about these things, for this is what pagans worry about. This is what the world is consumed with. This is the value set of those who will perish. They're constantly being defined by and living for and being shaped by worry and anxiousness over what they're going to wear and where they're going to live and what they're going to eat and how they're going to get and how much money they make or not make and where they live and how long they're going to live. And Don't do that. Seek my kingdom and my righteousness. Your heavenly Father knows all that you need. He'll supply it. You, you be absorbed with Christ, his cross, his kingdom, which is antithetical to everything about this temporal world. Luke 16, no servant can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Very next verse. Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, were listening to all these things, and they were scoffing at him. I'm reading into it. Because Jesus says, he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men. I think this is what the Pharisees were saying. What's wrong with money? What's wrong with wanting money? What's wrong with having a lot of it? Jesus didn't say there's anything wrong with money. He said there's something eternally damnable about loving it. There's a big difference, isn't there? So he concludes. You are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men, God hates. It's detestable. Because what is highly esteemed among men is anything but supreme love to Christ. If you want to define the world in one statement, it is this. The world will love, devote itself to, serve, worship anything but Christ alone. It will even love, serve, worship Christ, but it must be Christ and, not Christ alone. I give you 21st century modern evangelicalism. We want Christ, but we also want all that this world's got. Then you can't have Christ. You can't love the world and all that it has and say, I will love this and Christ. By now your mind is but Dan, can't we enjoy all the gifts that God gives us in this world? Absolutely. Enjoy them all. All the good gifts that come to you come from God. There's nothing you have that you did not receive. Enjoy it. Drink deeply from it. And in doing so, follow Augustine. He loves thee too little who loves anything together with thee, which he loves not for thy sake. Why do you love it? And do you give thanks? And can you say with Job, if it is taken away, the Lord gives, the Lord takes. Blessed be God. Or do you love that thing for that thing's sake? Do you love it for Christ's sake? Or do you love it for that thing's sake? Let me ask it another way. If you couldn't have Christ, but you could have the thing. Would that be okay with you? Let me ask it another way. If you can only have Christ and you can't have the thing, is that okay with you? Lots of different ways to ask it. So I can enjoy a great meal. I can enjoy the love of friend and family. But to what end? To the end that they become the object 
of my love and my devotion and my service and my worship. The world, can we love what hates Jesus? That may be another way of asking it. I'm, you, you can, I hope you can see I'm groping to find ways of asking the question to penetrate the, the hard casing the world puts on our minds. Can we love what hates Jesus? We know that the world hates Jesus. It hates Christ, it hates the Father, it hates the truth. And love for the world is absolutely incompatible with loving God. And the world hates those who love Christ. And it hates those who speak of Christ and speak about Christ. And they hate the truth of Christ. That's one way to know the world according to 1 John 4. They hate the truth. And the world demands conformity to itself. Isn't that interesting in John 15? The world loves its own and hates anything that doesn't conform to it. That's how the world gets you to conform to it. You want to play in our ballpark? You want us to like you? Conform to our value set. Don't conform to our value set, you don't get to play here. Matter of fact, we'll destroy you. We hate you. Does that make sense out of your lunch table now? Does that make sense why you eat alone? James 4. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Therefore, whoever makes himself a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Can the scriptures be more clear? C.S. Lewis wrote this little book called The Screwtape Letters where Screwtape, a chief demon instructing his nephew in how to destroy the life of a Christian, wrote this. An ever-increasing craving for an ever-diminishing pleasure is the formula. It is more certain, and it's better style, to get the man's soul and give him nothing in return. That is what really gladdens our Father's heart. He's talking about Satan. Give him the world. Give him all the world. Because the world will be destroyed. Give him the world because in giving him the world, you're giving him nothing. And in return, we get his soul. It's brilliant. There's an old hymn we don't sing much because the tune is archaic. We should sing it anyway. Take the world, but give me Jesus. I'm asking, really. And we really mean that. For our final text, we go to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13, verse 5. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money. Being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you, so that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Verse 12. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. So let us go out to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we do not have a lasting city. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. With that ringing your ears, look back at chapter 11, verse 13. All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having, been, having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, for those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. God is not ashamed to be called their God. 
For he has prepared a city for them. Chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the races set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. He endured the cross, despising the shame. If you follow me, take up your cross daily, and then you can follow me. Don't be ashamed of me, for if you're ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of you at my return. Endured the cross, despising the shame, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself. Why? So that you do not grow weary and faint. This world is going to cause you to faint, to capitulate, to cave, to give in. It is easier. And it feels good. And Jesus, bloodied on a cross, shamed by the world, speaks to you again. If you're mine, you follow me. I am more satisfying than anything this world can offer you. You'll taste it now. You'll swim in the ocean of it later. But if you don't follow me, you'll get this world. And you'll perish with it. Because you'll lose your soul. This is how Jesus speaks. This is how Jesus calls a person. That's why I ask the question, take the world but give me Jesus. Really? Really? The diagnostics are difficult. The diagnostics come at us and say, what are we living for? The question of why screams at us. Why, why am I living this way? Why are these things important? Why this course? Jesus pleads for us as Christians to consider how deeply we have drunk and repent. As one would say, or are we in bondage to the pleasures of this world so that for all our talk about the glory of God, we love television and food and sleep and sex and money and human praise just like everybody else. If so, let us repent, fix our faces like flint toward the word of God, and let us pray. O oh Lord, open my eyes to see the sovereign sight that in your presence is fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Grant, O oh God, that we would live the legacy of sovereign joy. Unless we love the world the way the world loves the world. Brothers and sisters, please. This is not a Sunday morning contemplation. This demands that you and I find a closet Read and drink deep from the word of God. Respond in prayer to the voice of God. And plead for our soul's sake that God would reveal to us are we Christian? Are we Christian? And if we are, then run after what we love. Don't walk. Run to Jesus. Run after Jesus. 
at all risk and at all cost. I say to my heart, the hearts of my children who sit in this congregation today, the hearts of you, my friends, this world has nothing for you. And this world is everything. All that you could ever want Nothing, nothing that you need. Christ, Christ. Christ is life, and everything else is not. Let's pray together. Our Father, rescue us from the enslavement that our enemy has orchestrated in mind in affection, in body. There are friends here sitting here today who are addicted to some earthly pleasure. May this be a day where you break the bonds and show that Christ is more to be desired. There are others whose minds can only think by the value set of the world because that's how they've learned to survive in it. God, may this be a day where their minds are set free to think like Christians. There are others whose affections are so drunk with the world's goods that Christ is not desired at all. May all of those things taste brackish and bitter in our mouths so that Christ is sweet. We give ourselves to you pleading now for your help. Come for your namesake, for your namesake, for the exaltation of Christ. Help us in Jesus' name. Shall we stand together?